Before the invention of photography, art history was dominated by narrative figure painting. And then movies came along and became the visual medium for telling stories of human experience. So if you'd rather use a paintbrush than a movie camera to tell your story, you'd better be at the top of your game. Movie directors must consider many different things, including the plot of the film, how the actors move around and speak, and the editing of shots. But importantly, each frame of film is a still image, not unlike a briefly glimpsed painting. My favorite analysis of composing figures comes from Louis Gianetti's wonderful textbook, Understanding Movies. Gianetti has chapters on all the elements of filmmaking, but I believe his first two chapters can be used as a primer for anyone who wants to understand or better design narrative paintings. Chapter one is on photography and chapter two is on mise-en-scene, which translates as placing onto the stage. I want to share some insights that I gleaned from this book, along with some of my own thoughts about how narrative painters can learn from directors and cinematographers. Since both filmed and painted images are two-dimensional, Let's start with basic abstract design and its effects on us. Abstract design is considered by many artists as the most important aspect of their work. It's the idea that composition alone, independent of subject matter, expresses ideas and evokes emotion. About composition, Gianetti asks, how is the two-dimensional space segmented and organized? What is the underlying design? Just using basic geometric shapes, I'm going to build two compositions. But despite their shared subject matter, they're very different. Gianetti asks about the form. Is it open or closed? Does the image suggest a window that arbitrarily isolates a fragment of the scene? Or a proscenium arch in which the visual elements are carefully arranged and held in balance? What he refers to as closed versus open, I call classical versus Baroque. Three key aspects that differ in these two our use of symmetry, the primary visual movement, and whether the frame crops any of the shapes in a way that brings attention. Classical designs are typically symmetrical. A line down the middle reveals a careful balance, but with variations that add interest. Baroque designs are often quite asymmetrical the left and right sides are very different. The major movement in a classical design is horizontal or sometimes vertical. In Baroque designs, the eye is led diagonally, often with a series of thrusts that oppose that major diagonal. Classical designs often have no cropping at all or cropping in very natural places, like how Mona Lisa's body is cropped at her waist. Everything that is important is contained within the frame. In Baroque designs, the cropping can be more dramatic, and this suggests Gianetti's window that arbitrarily isolates a fragment of the scene. 
Classical designs give a sense of calm, order, and authority. Baroque designs feel dynamic, emphasizing life's vibrancy and flux and how it can sometimes veer out of control. A pure example of classical design is Da Vinci's Last Supper. A pure example of Baroque design is Caravaggio's Sacrifice of Isaac. Most figure compositions are on a spectrum between these two extremes. Here are two photos from the New York Times. I would call this one a hybrid classical. Despite the intense cropping of the foreground soldiers, the symmetry and strong vertical movement give a sense of containment. This one is hybrid Baroque. The central figure and lack of unusual cropping are classical, but asymmetry and violent diagonal movement are very Baroque. This situation looks to be anything but contained. These two photos also illustrate Gianetti's ideas about framing. Tight framing by the edges of the canvas, painted enclosures, or the space itself can make characters seem trapped, constricted, or cozy. But loose framing gives them room to maneuver through the pictorial space. Why do we react the way we do to classical and Baroque designs? Why does bilateral symmetry and reliance on horizontals and verticals make us accept the rightness of a picture, but asymmetry and diagonals make us feel more disconcerted. I think it comes down to our relationship to the world and to our bodies. As far as our bodily experience goes, unless we are astronauts, the world is flat and horizontal, and we are little vertical lines standing astride it. All our architecture is based on horizontals and verticals, as is gravity. If we find ourselves on a tilt, there's a problem, as many a drunk realizes just before they hit the floor. Now, how about symmetry and balance? If you think about a seesaw, there are different kinds of balance. Perfect mirror symmetry has two identical objects equidistant from the center. We are attracted to people who have this kind of symmetry. I myself am neither good looking nor symmetrical, but look what happens when I mirror my good side to become perfectly symmetrical. Hello, ladies. Not all bilateral symmetry involves a mirror image. With art, unlike with people, we prefer the two sides to have variations. Balance, yes. Mirror image, no. Another truism of the seesaw is that a small object far from the center can balance a large one close to the center. Art critic John Kennedy said that objects further from the center of a painting carry more visual weight. And another kind of asymmetric balance involves the seesaw being on a slant, and thus Baroque compositions are balanced, but in an asymmetrical manner. Gestalt theorists point out that people need to see an organized pattern in their visual field, so anything the artist can do to help make a unified design is useful. Here's a random bunch of shapes 
a bit confusing. Here's a basket of fruit with a single grape on the side, much easier to make sense of. Skillful narrative artists often group figures together in underlying flat geometric shapes. By the way, you may have noticed isosceles triangles in the middle of some of our classical designs. Why is that? Well, if you're going for stability and order, some shapes are harder to knock over than others. And if you do manage to knock a triangle off its rocker, you have really unleashed some dangerous forces. So far, we've been dealing with two-dimensional space and there are wonderful artistic traditions that never leave that arena. But because the real world is three-dimensional, we can make our work appear more believable by building an illusion of volume and space. Cameras do this automatically, but artists must do some heavy lifting. Volume is achieved by using light and shade to model forms. Often there's a light mass, a shadow mass, highlights, cast shadows, and a reflected light. Let's see how different styles of lighting are exploited by visual storytellers. High key lighting fully illuminates a scene. It's not dramatic, but very good for descriptive accuracy. Low key lighting was popularized by Caravaggio in the early 17th century. Often it's combined with high contrast, which gives it a very dramatic quality. We humans are always a little scared of the dark and see any bit of light as a refuge. A movie genre, film noir, is based on this. Edward Hopper was very influenced by these films. Lighting normally comes from above and the side, but other lighting directions can have striking effects. Space is achieved by linear perspective, invented in the 1400s by Italian artists. It's a geometric method of accurately positioning objects in three-dimensional space. Painters think of the viewer and the depicted figures as being on opposite sides of a so-called picture plane. The picture plane is like a virtual piece of glass, upon which the three-dimensional scene is projected. The viewer always has his eager nose pressed up against the picture plane, but the characters on the other side can be placed in varying distances away from it. Typically, artists and filmmakers think of a foreground, middle ground, and background. Artists handle this in different ways. Here the three layers are compressed, as if seen through a long lens. My all-time favorite evocation of space is in The Return of the Hunters by Bruegel. From the defecating dog in the extreme foreground to the distant mountain peaks, the richness of village life is spectacularly revealed. As objects move away from the picture plane, their size, color intensity, and value contrast all diminish. 
Bruegel's placement of the black bird over the far background demonstrates this effect. Cinematographers use filters to affect color and space. Painters can use color mixing, brush strokes, and thin washes of paint applied on top of previous layers. Here are a couple examples where space itself helps tell the story. Fred Danziger places his Pittsburgh girl walking away from us in the middle ground. And the distant background shows what an arduous climb she has ahead of her. Notice Winslow Homer's very distant placement of the ship in the fog warning. The fisherman has an insurmountable distance to row to get back to his ship before he becomes lost in the fog forever. I began this by looking at how abstract design affects us. But people are not geometric shapes. And when we use them as elements of design, all sorts of psychological factors come into play. In his book, Gianetti discusses what anthropologist Edward T. Hall calls proxemic patterns, the space between themselves that people desire in different social situations. He breaks it down to public, social, personal, and intimate. In movies, the camera lens becomes a stand-in for the viewer's eye. So in considering how actors are to be filmed, Giannetti asks, what type of shot? How far away from the action is the camera? Essentially, what's the distance between you, the viewer, and the depicted characters? As we've just learned, the closer you are, the more intimate your relationship with them becomes. In a long shot, the figures are somewhat dwarfed by their surroundings, and we are unlikely to become emotionally invested in them if they remind us of ants. In a close-up, the viewer gets a more personal feeling about the figure. Charlie Chaplin suggested to use a long shot for comedy, but a close-up for tragedy. I might add that close-ups can sometimes bond you to the character in ways that have nothing to do with feeling sorry for them. Many images use what filmmakers would call a full shot, which shows the figures from head to toe. This format is used for full-length portraits, but can also be surprisingly effective in narrative paintings. In a medium shot, there's more room above and below the figures. Medium shots are good for arranging figures like actors on a stage, which makes the medium shot particularly popular with narrative painters. Have you ever wondered why political posters so often depict the candidate from below? Just as our viewing distance from a person has psychological effects, so does our viewing angle. Low angles make the person seem powerful and heroic. High angles can suggest the opposite, helplessness, weakness, that the character is a victim of fate. I believe this wonderful portrait tells us why. Children depend on adults for everything, and because they are smaller, they have to look up at the all-powerful grown-up. Politicians want us to see them 
and need them as if they were our loving parents. By the way, a high angle is not inherently sinister. It can also portray lovely ballerinas seen from a theater balcony, or a dreamy younger brother in paradise glimpsed from a second story window. Perhaps he's fantasizing about becoming a gondolier. And of course, a medium angle shot is very commonly used. It makes the viewer feel like he's the equal of the characters in the scene. Welcome to our world, dear viewer. The direction in which a character is looking also has important psychological ramifications. Gianetti writes, the more we see of the face, the greater our sense of privileged intimacy. The less we see, the more mysterious and inaccessible the character will seem. In fictional movies, the actors don't look at the camera. But in narrative art, characters have been known to look at that guy on the other side of the picture plane. Hey John, we hear you've been on the wagon for almost a year. When's that going to end? All kidding aside, documentaries like this one are where you're most likely to have the actor staring into the camera. Here's looking at you, kid. When a character in a painting looks at you, it turns you into a fellow character. The greatest use of this in narrative painting is in Velazquez's Las Meninas. Not only are many of the characters looking at us, including the little princess, but the viewer's eyeball is positioned in the head of the King of Spain, whose portrait is currently being worked on by the artist, who's also looking at you. Las Meninas makes you want to wear a crown when you're looking at it. Earlier, we saw how artists sometimes group their characters into geometric shapes. Here, Tom Mallon masterfully does that in perspective. The staging and arranging of characters into proxemic groups, their body language, poses and gestures, and where they look relative to one another are of paramount importance to narrative painters. These can help illustrate stories of conflict, mystery, love, and longing, and sometimes all of the above. Here are three groups, each of whom shares a personal or intimate space, but a public space separates the groups. The interrupted lovers react with shame and rage. The staring men laugh and point. The mother, mouth agog, stares as well, but shields her daughter's eyes from the scandalous scene. Often, the target of the male gaze is oblivious to it. So is it really so terrible? Maybe not here but in Artemisia Gentileschi's painting, it sure is. The power that this 17th century woman artist generates comes from the tight framing, the characters' poses and direction of their eyes, the tilted triangle that contains the men, and especially their unwanted violation of her personal space. They're not just ogling her. They are doing it from inches away, and she knows it. This man is maintaining a polite social distance from the women he's spying upon. They don't know he's there. So what's going to happen if he crosses the street to chat them up? Here we have two couples in very different proxemic patterns. This duo represents a love match 
successfully achieved. But the distance between these two, along with the direction of his glance and their body positions, speak to a thwarted desire. I love this image of teenage longing. The androgynous figure leaning in from the side yearns to connect with the boy in the varsity jacket. The unrequited crush is observed but probably quickly dismissed by a kid riding by on his bike. We generally think of intimate contact in sexual or romantic terms, but it can also suggest any intense emotion. In Giotto's psychological masterpiece, Christ and Judas stare each other down. They are utterly still while all about them forms violently undulate. Happy couples are physically close and look at each other. Let's see how narrative artists handle the unhappy couple. Degas separates them and has the woman turn her back on her guy. Walter Sickert uses three-dimensional depth to separate his couple. Lost in their own thoughts, their connection seems irrevocably broken. We talked about how abstract design, independent of subject matter, affects us. But when the subject matter is human beings, even tiny changes in composition can significantly alter the meaning. We see this in a drawing by Edgar Gerens. He drew this forlorn couple about 20 years ago, but last year he changed the head position of the woman. To me, the first version could be summed up as, she won't. The second version, he can't. When looking at a picture, the dominant is that which first grabs our attention. We then seek secondary points of interest, which are called subsidiaries. The dominant and subsidiaries are not necessarily people. They could be colors or shapes as well. Art historian T.J. Clark wrote about Poussin's landscape with a calm. The first thing that caught my eye was the placing of the goat herd's hair exactly at the intersection of shoreline and hummock, with the man's curls silhouetted against the blue of the lake. And then I noticed the spearhead of white on the water just above the head, the brightest white in the picture. For me, the dominant is the red vestment that the goat herd is wearing. It really stands out in this generally cool colored painting. A strong subsidiary would be the central castle in the distance. But in a painting as rich as this one, there is no shortage of important subsidiaries. In this painting by Joseph Wright of Derby, my eye first goes to the children. They have the brightest light and are nicely held within the geometry of the planetary device. I then take my time examining the adults in the composition. In most narrative paintings, the dominant and main subsidiaries are, in fact, people, or at least people adjacent. Think of the dominant as the star and the subsidiaries as supporting actors. Hmm, returning soldier or exuberant doggy? Not sure who owns this scene, but it's pretty clear who the star of this picture is and who is the less glamorous character actor. The viewer's identity and personality are key to making these decisions. 
There's no doubt in my mind that Sleeping Beauty owns this scene, but somebody else might first look at the guy or the flowers. When you have a cast of thousands, you might require a real narcissist to be the dominating presence. Here, Napoleon, after having crowned himself, is about to crown his wife. Here's an example that I find problematic. When the dominant is not that different from the many, many subsidiaries, a narrative painting can seem like an abstract action painting, just an overall pattern without any clear order of importance. These last few examples show large crowds. Often important people get more space than the rest of us. This painting of a Clash concert shows how you'd be less likely to get COVID if you were in the band as opposed to in the audience. One of my favorite paintings of a famous person in front of a crowd is this picture of Obama campaigning in Harrisburg. He's a tiny figure in the distant background and everyone has their back to the viewer as they try to catch a glimpse of him. Everyone, that is, except for this couple. More motivated by love than politics, they gaze into each other's eyes. In his book, Louis Giannetti writes, A systematic mise-en-scene analysis of any given shot includes the following 12 elements. He then goes on to analyze a film still using these elements. I'm going to try to do this with a painting, but how do I pick one? In this movie, I've shown works from artists I have known and filmed, from old masters and other famous artists, but also from some who were totally unknown to me until recently. These I learned about from Joel Rundell and Isabel Maria Rego, artist friends of mine who've been posting on Facebook. Thanks so much, Joel and Isabel, and it's an artist that you introduced me to that I have chosen. Joseph Kinzel was an Austrian painter who died in 1925. He was known for his tavern scenes, and this one I find quite intriguing. What I see is an exhausted tavern maid, the only female in the picture, surrounded on both sides by men. The group on the left are leering at her. The tavern owner and his dog are not amused. In the background, one figure watches while others seem oblivious. The composition is classical with a strong horizontal movement, no significant cropping, and bilateral symmetry. The framing is somewhat tight, but feels more cozy than oppressive. A strong rectangle contains the figures at the table. An oval shape helps frame some of the men in the background. Overall, it is a medium distance shot with the key characters in the foreground and some lesser ones trailing off into the middle ground. It's an interior scene, but you can glimpse some houses in the distance through a window at the back of the tavern. And the camera angle is also medium. Viewers see this scene as if they were seated about six feet in front of the table, close to a personal proxemic with the woman and our eyes are at the same level as hers. Since we are seated, we are looking up at the standing tavern owner. This gives him a slightly heroic quality. The lighting is relatively high key and the contrast is enough to make the forms three-dimensional, but not dramatically so. 
The most dramatic contrast is in the old man's face, which makes him seem a bit menacing. The paint application is matter of fact and presents the image without bringing undue attention to itself. The restrained color palette made up of earth tones keeps emotions in check. The men on the left are in an intimate proxemic with one another. The space from them to the owner is more of a social distance. The heads are mostly in profile or quarter turn position, except for the woman whose head faces us directly and thus bonds us to her. She is almost, but not quite, looking at us. These men are looking at her. The tavern owner looks at them and holds a heavy tankard that could be used as a cudgel if necessary. But the male characters are all leaning away from the woman and this suggests that no violent action is likely to occur. In my interpretation, the woman is the dominant here. Not only is she the sole female surrounded by eight males, her central position, fatigued body language, and head facing the viewer makes her the first thing I looked at in the painting. She really owns this scene. The key subsidiaries are the heroic tavern owner and the leering drunkards. And let's not forget the dog. His inclusion helps the painting in a number of ways. In real life, he'd be hoping for something tasty to fall off the table. In the painting, however, his shape helps complete the oval that I mentioned before. Plus, there's a nice parabolic sweep from his head and back through the tankard that keeps the viewer's eye from veering off the right side of the canvas. And even though Freud said that sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, the dog's thin protruding head aimed directly at the maid's lap gives one pause and emphasizes the underlying sexual tension that gives this painting such a jolt. Here, Kinzel uses the same basic ingredients, but creates a very different feeling. It shows how subtle changes in applying Louis Gianetti's elements can drastically affect the meaning of a narrative image. Whether you agree with my interpretation or not, you have to admit it's great fun to try to figure out the meaning of narrative artworks and to work out how that is achieved formally by the artist. We need stories like we need air, and Louis Gianetti's understanding movies will help visual artists tell their stories well. Three of the artists whose work appears in this movie, Bo Bartlett, Noah Buchanan, and Carl Dobsky, have curated a show of contemporary narrative art. Big Stories will be at the Bo Bartlett Center in Columbus, Georgia through December 16th, 2023, but then it will travel to the New York Academy of Art in January. It's a great opportunity to see some fantastic narrative art in person.